VC funding model and the way it works. And, and you know, we'd been in a position in the past where we'd been in companies where you'd lost control. So that was a really big thing for us with the principle of maintaining control for not just because, you know, you want to be a control freak, um, but if you believe in what you're doing, you put the right mission and strategy together, the idea that you would lose that to somebody who's not as passionate about that just didn't work for us. So, you know, when we went through the crowdfunding piece after we talked to a bunch of uh, traditional guys, and, you know, I even talked to a a mate of mine who I won't mention his name, but he is mentioned in, um, in the Every Bastard Said No book. Uh, so he, he's a really good guy. He's a VC. And he just looked at me and he said, you know, your valuation aspirations are too high. So you need to cut that back and you need to give up more equity. So it was sort of a double-edged sword. So then we thought, well, we'll give this, this crowdfunding thing a kick and spend some time going through the university and those sort of things. And it may look a little daunting on the outside, but it was actually quite an easy process. Um, and for again, for a corporate junkie like me that spent years building presentations in IBM, being able to put all that stuff together is relatively straightforward. So that if, if you're not across that, get somebody who can do it for you. But it was it was a pretty good process and they were really helpful. Now, um, mistakes do happen. And, do. And, I, and I have to go out to the to the crowd and say that, thank you for your Q&A early. And I thought seven questions early, but the, the questions were, we were on mute. <laughs> For, for, for the first few minutes of that, so um, oh, I'm, I'm doing this solo. Lilia's uh, away this week uh, on a well-deserved holiday. So fast forwarding, what we were just talking about when I unmuted was, was crowdsourcing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um, really concisely, Nigel, invisible urban founder who's jumped into the US, um, raised $1.3 million on crowdfunding. And maybe we'll just sort of summarise the front end of, of that um, and feel free to just jump in in terms of questions um, around that. But now Visible Urban, based in the US, doing stunningly well. Um, anything else I missed, unless you're a lip reader, just um, sing out on the Q&A, but apologies for that. It's never actually been on mute before when we've kicked off. But um, UI on the new, on the new Yeah, channel. yeah, there's a, there's a first time for everything. So so 1.3, you know, to your point, 850k US. And then you basically, in the sort of EV charging field, I guess it still feels, you know, having an electric vehicle and trying to find a place to charge it, we're pretty early here. We are. Um, so you decided to go to the US. Uh, walk us through that, because not only did you decide to go to the US, but you decided to go in a pretty turbulent time um, in all things in terms of anxiety for family and, and, and lots of yeah. kind of personal stuff going on on COVID and so forth, and, um, and somewhere in the US. So, you know, tell us that story about I'm going to go. Oh, look, you know, the, the, what do they say? I quite like the saying the perfect is the enemy of the good. So if you wait for the perfect scenario, you never do anything. If you, and, it, and it's just procrastination by a different name. So we had been working this up since 2019. I'd done a stint into the US, so I'd actually lined up an advisor. So you know, one of the big things to take out of this chat, if nothing else, is find the right smart people that, that are aligned with your objectives and can actually help you in, in the markets that you're going into. So I've done three trips in that first quarter of 2020. Um, three I, trips in a quarter? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the first one was for a 15-minute interview, or 15-minute uh, meeting with a woman by the name of Eileen Murray. So if you Google Eileen Murray, she's um, the ex-co-CEO uh, of Bridgewater Associates, which is Ray Dalio's hedge fund. So I'd gone in there all shiny thinking I could get a meeting with Ray Dalio. In the end, I got, uh, I got hopefully, hopefully Ray doesn't see this, but I got somebody better. So, um, <laughs> so Eileen's been absolutely fantastic. But yeah, we did three trips in the US, um, got out, got the pamphlet as I came through the airport saying, well, there's this thing called COVID. You might want to think about it. And then the country got locked down. So, and we built everything up, getting ready to go. Hadn't done the cash piece. I wanted to get a good, solid business model in place, all that pieces. And then, you know, did the cash piece and thought, we just got to go. So during last year, we, we left. Thought that I could get back in the country you know, arrogantly. Turns out I couldn't. So um, as my wife would say, uh, and, you know, I've got a wife and two young children, five and seven-year-old at the time. Uh, she would tell me it was 72 days. She's very exact about that. Yeah. Uh, and then she packed everything up and came over. Wow, wow. And so that first trip, because this is a, an anxiety that I remember having too. Sorry, I'm, I'm running off a, an unusual iPad today. But um, that anxiety of like, I know there's something there. I've got to get on a plane, I think. But yeah. 
you know, I'll, I'll try and fill a bunch of meetings. Yeah. You know, if you've got co-founders and other people, it's not just you, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of the money you're spending, but you decided to do that for a 15-minute meeting. Yep. Um, would you do that again? Yeah, in a heartbeat. Yeah. So, you know, there's once you've done, you've worked out what you're doing, you've got a business model, you think you've got, it's a thesis, right? So you've got a thesis you think is going to fly and you've got a, a meeting set up with the right people that you've spent some time thinking about. You know what it's like, you just got to go. Um, it, it could have could have been a waste of time. I ended up finding, you know, a year later that uh, not only did she stay for 45 minutes, but she bumped off the next meeting that was after mine, which was with Ray Dalio. <laughs> <laughs> so I was pretty stoked about that. Yeah. But uh, it, it, yeah, it was literally for a 15 minute meeting on the 4th of January. So right after New Year's and I just went. So great stuff. And um, yeah, uh, I did look at um, Eileen's credentials as a serious well and still a director, I think, of Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. Uh, Chair of FINRA as well. So right. the financial um, industry association so they've got 213,000 members uh yeah she used to manage 20,000 staff directly herself so she was uh COO at Morgan Stanley so you know, Morgan Stanley Credit Suisse has been all over all of that stuff so she's 40 years um in, in the financial services industry so I know this is going through founders heads as we're talking about this because you know we've all been in this situation like a serious wheel in business you've got the meeting you know you've got on the plane um Talk us through to whatever level you're comfortable, just what you're thinking you're going to put across in that 15 minutes. Oh, you know, you've seen it, you read the books. It's all about crispening up that elevator pitch, as terrible as it sounds. So you've got to make make it that it's as, as crisp as possible. And it, it, you've also got to do the research in terms of who, who you're meeting with. I saw a um, video the other day about Simon Sinek, and, and he mm-hmm. said... Uh, the person who was interviewing him said, oh, one of the principles, you know, treat people the way they, the way you, you want to be treated. And he said, well, no, that's not right. You treat people the way they want to be treated. So, you know, we categorically, for any meeting we go into in the US, we have a New Zealand-based EA who looks after my diary and does a whole lot of other stuff, but she'll do background checks on everyone. So we understand not only what they're into from a professional perspective, but also what is that spins their wheels in regards to private stuff, um, any hobbies or anything like that that they're into. I knew that it was an interesting time for Eileen where, where she was in terms of Bridgewater. Um, and you know, she's someone who really likes all the entrepreneurial stuff as well. And, and has, you know, she's spent a career championing DE and I, um, done a lot of work in that space, and we, we were very focused on having a, a very balanced team in terms of growing that out so do that background research have a very crisp pitch um, and then just shut up and listen so you know, she she talked a lot about what was important to her and, and it was just a matter of, of listening and resonating with that if it didn't work it didn't work but you know, she, Eileen uses this word a lot in terms of talking about what what she does now she said well for a start she can choose who she works with now because she's a that, that stage, um, but authenticity. So you, you, you know, I could never sell cigarettes. <laughs> I just don't believe in it. But if, if you're really passionate about mm-hmm. what it is you do, that comes across. Yeah. So that authenticity really, really came across. Plus, she told me afterwards that uh, she really liked the fact that I thanked the um, the person behind the counter and she treated them like a human. Uh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And we will come back to that DNI um, stuff as well because. Uh, uh, I'm really interested in your views, having now set up in Austin about where this whole ESG thing is yep. at. And, and don't get me wrong, I'm not trivialising it, but I think you know it'll probably be called something else um, for a whole bunch of reasons. But just this recognition of social and environment and stuff, and yep. of course the domain you're, you're playing in is um, is uh, is a massive part of that in terms of the opportunity. So for the audience, because um, again, I know the the story just in terms of giving them some indications of scale. So you know, some of us have products where we're quite happy to get, you know, 500 customers and their yeah. enterprise and that sort of thing. So give us a bit of a sense of the EV market, what part you play in and, and you know, what a what a meaningful order means uh, to you and your business and probably more importantly, what you were able to achieve because I'm figuring it's probably more than meaningful with the traction you've got to now. Oh, well, look, Holly, it's, um, it comes back to that, do you want to have impact or not, right? So for us, impact was about scale and New Zealand, I think, roughly has 350, maybe 400 public EV charging stations throughout the country, which is pretty good. Um, it's getting better, but it's pretty pretty good. But we knew to have a big impact, we need to go to a much bigger market. 
Um, Europe is actually a relatively mature market from an EV charging perspective, and the US, as much as they don't like me saying it, is actually still rather rather immature. But 236 million cars. So New Zealand's got what 1.7 million cars. Oh, yeah. They got 276 million for mm. 330 million people. So you know it's almost a one to one ratio. Wait, 276 million for 330 people. Yeah. 300. Wow. It's crazy, right? So there's a lot of two car. Yeah. 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 It's crazy, and then the, the number of EVs when we went over was like one point five million. Whoa. So now it's, it's over two or three million now, but it's still not huge. So there's a huge amount of opportunity. So we did a lot of market analysis to say where's this going to go, and in terms of public charging, in terms of EV charging, there's a hundred today. There's about one hundred twenty thousand public chargers in the market. So we went in in June last year. We had no sales pipeline, no sales team. Um, we had a bunch of connections through our wider team, and we thought we had a pretty good business model. Dial forward 14 months, uh, we have under contract now 120,363 charges. We have a sales pipeline that today has 3.3 million charges in it. And we believe strongly by the end of this year, we will close out with 520,000 charges under contract. Once we get those in the ground, and that's a big piece, and we partnered with some major players for that piece, we didn't look to do it ourselves. Yeah. Um, we will be the largest EV charging network company in the world by a factor of three. And then you've got all of the other pipeline stuff. And then the beauty of our contracts is we do a 10 plus five, but we get exclusive access to all the spaces. So even if you stop today with half a million, which is roughly 10%, you've still got that massive amount of growth that you could do over the next decade. And so it is literally just a, a massive scale difference. There's so much to unpack in that. So, you, you know, you, you've got a forecast that gets you to 520,000 units. I mean, I don't even know what New Zealand will end up when it is at scale in terms of charging units. It'll be, be several thousand, I would say. Like uh, at least to 10,000. Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, for sure. So you've gone and already proved the, the same amount of effort to try and conquer New Zealand yep. and you're basically driving a global position or certainly a you know wider North American position yep. 520,000 and it's a physical product it's a physical product um, so there's an installation there so that's pretty heavy I want to dive into that and then and you get the rights when you say to the spaces is that to enhance with software and different, different things that well think about it if, if someone's got and we've got a client who literally has 1.6 million spaces right so they're massive um, but that's that's big globally. Um, so 1.6 million spaces, we're going to deploy 160,000 charges, but we've got the rights to deploy to that remaining one point, well, the total 1.6 right, right. million spaces. First. Yeah, yeah, and that's in that 10 year period. So if you believe that this climate change thing is not going to go away, if you believe that there's massive tailwinds behind electrifying transport, then that in its own right is a, a huge amount of business potential. Um, going forward so and then finding that the model and what we're putting together is resonating really well too so but yeah we we viewed it as again comes back to that chat we had before about control we looked at it and said we need to have two parts of the puzzle we need to have the hardware piece and we need to have the software piece and we are working with fantastic software companies <laughs> that's we better to disclose that it's one of the companies that i that i chair um on the north shore and oh look they are absolutely brilliant and what what i've loved in terms of our american team is i, I said to our software guys that we hired in america i said you have a look at these guys tell me what you think so i, I didn't influence it at all and you tell you come back and you tell and he absolutely loves all the team members like absolutely loves them wants to build up the capability over here so uh, yeah that that's been absolutely fantastic but hardware and software and then we have both a B2B customer model and a B2C customer model. So it's relatively complex and then a hell of a lot of finance we have to raise. I'm kind of pissed that you didn't sort of use some influence on 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 then on your CTO, but it's come out, it's come out okay <laughs> for us. Um, He's come to the conclusion by himself that Kiwi's yeah, no, good to do business. You could have given him an extra <laughs> money out or something, mate. Um, it's noted. But um, that whole sort of flow back effect to New Zealand, because I think this is you know, there's a classic thing here, as we've probably all seen, which is, oh, you know, <clears throat> a lot of support for these businesses, government support, other support, and then, you know, the, the inverted commas, then they bugger off overseas. But, you know, I think the smarter and more educated person, and my question is going to be around what you potentially wouldn't feel comfortable from what you've seen in terms of quality 
of the things that make your business work, what you wouldn't consider actually coming back into New Zealand for. Now, of course, there's, there's limitations, but you know, you've described sort of technology provision, which is cool, but is there anything for the audience that, <clears throat> that you just went, hey, the US is like a mile ahead here, there's just nothing in New Zealand we consider to, to actually come back and, and use? Interestingly enough, we gave the government piece three cracks, right. three different avenues, and I won't specifically go into those avenues. We got rejected out of course every time. Yeah. We were a bit early for what they were looking at. They were concerned that we would be US based and bringing you, and we just said, look, we're going to make a lot of money in America. It'd be good for that to fly back into New Zealand. It was a sort of non compute moment. Um, so there were some challenges that we found with, with that piece, and we did try and do that piece. So we've done this without any local support. So yeah. don't worry, taxpayers, we haven't got a dollar from any New Zealand taxpayers. Um, in terms of what we would look uh, for our business model in terms of New Zealand, the software piece without a doubt. Mm. And reason being is because whether the guys believe it's overpaid or whatever, it's it's a relatively competitive um, cost model, particularly in the US. In the US and Austin, try and hire software engineers. I mean, these, yeah, they are very expensive. So, you know, as a as an operating efficiency model, having people in New Zealand actually makes a lot of sense. Because, um, you know, they're here for a bunch of reasons. They're making good money in New Zealand, but it's a quantum in the States yeah. for a bunch of reasons. So that's important. But even if it was the same dollars, the work ethic is different. And um, in my experience anyway, and the quality. So, you know, we, we, we had a group in the States try and hack what the team had built and they found one problem and it wasn't even that major. They, they were blown away by the quality of what the team had produced. Not to blow smoke up their ass too much, mate. But there was- Thanks, buddy. <laughs> it, it was actually, it was really, really good. And, and the people that we've had in America that have looked at it have been really impressed. So software, definitely. Hardware, I would never look at New Zealand. Mm. We just can't do scale. We yeah. don't make stuff at scale. To give you an idea, so one of our manufacturers is committing to make us 100,000 charges in one year. Mm. And that's just a monumental effort. And, and you know, to do that at scale and at quality, um, it's, it's a German company we're working with, but to do that at that sort of scale, there's no way New Zealand could do that. Yeah, so, yeah, it's just the reality of it. Yeah, and, and you know, it's not a very sustainable thing to do anyway to make something in New Zealand and ship it to the States. You're better off localizing it as much as you can. So, yeah. I'm going to ask you um, uh, in a minute about Austin because, oh, yeah. you know, that's a decision I visited you over there. You showed me some. Austin Hospitality, I think we had breakfast. Um, and yeah, it was quite quite uh, quite interesting to hear your view. So I'd love you to share that. But folks, um, just intervening, and I feel very loved, but also like a dickhead for having it on mute for the first few minutes. <laughs> but thanks for your texts and questions. Um, we are going to roll into them. Uh, those that are not related to the fact you can't hear anything we're saying uh, shortly. So if you do have any, let us know. Um, yeah, Austin. Texas, why that side of the, you know, this is kind of e, you know, electric everything, Silicon Valley, all of these places where in theory, you know, the latest and greatest like you're working on should be, but you chose Texas and you chose Austin. Yeah, look, for a couple of reasons. So Austin's now viewed as the Silicon Valley of the South. Right. We've seen a lot of transference happening. So, you know, Google's got their massive new building down there. Actually, our, our space is beside that. Yep. Uh, we, we sort of went into a shared space where the university software engineers come into. So that works quite good for us too. We did that intentionally. A lot of young, talented software engineers coming up through that, that place. I mean, you've only got to go to the park in the middle of the in the weekends and you could tell it's full of software engineers. Yeah. Um, Tesla's got their factory there, so largest single factory I believe in the world, so yep. 20,000 employees. Um, you've got all of the other sort of, I think SAP's got a big campus there, Apple's got a big campus there. And you look at it and go, well, do you think you could seriously compete with those guys? And I honestly think we can because people want a mission. They want to make an impact. And, you know, we're not just building some software app. You know, we're taking dirty cars off the road as a result. So yeah. We don't do, you know, ours is indirect in that you put the infrastructure in and then more people will jump to it as a result. But you know, that, that mission-based um, approach will, attracts talents. We've had that with every American that's come on board the team has said, well, that was the biggest thing that attracted us. They talked about that first before they talked about package. Yeah, which just blew me away. I mean, our, our software guy, Brandon, I don't, I 
and I've given me a brain and I've been in love. He, he just said to me, because uh, I was talking about office space and where you go in Austin, and he said, oh, these guys will work out a garage for you. Right, because what they're doing at the moment is relatively soulless. They're not seeing any sort of impact. Um, he's now got first EV as a result, and so, which is a big deal. Um, but Austin is, it's got a really good energy. Uh, it's a relatively young city. Mm. I mean, the airport's struggling a bit at the moment, but um, it is, a, and it's healthy. You know, the, the food's good. If you like music, it's fantastic. Not that I'm advocating we lose any, we brain drain New Zealand any further than we need to, but Austin is just a great part of of, uh, of America in general. So you, when we tell people that we've, we've got a, a head office space out of Austin, they just go, oh, it's fantastic. Which is weird, isn't it? And I didn't mean to sort of bring that in because the Austin calls itself Austin weird. Austin, but, you know, it's the, it's the capital of Texas, as most of you know. Lilia and I did a, a quick visit there just to see what all the, the hype and, you know, this identification is the Silicon Valley of the, of the East, I'm sure other cities in, in the US would contest that, but I, I've heard that um, predominantly around Austin too. But um, it's, it's, a, it's a, you know, because a lot of people, when I said we're going to Austin, were, were, were instantly on the, you know, this is a, this is a redneck uh, state, you know, you, you wouldn't want to be here because it's unpleasant. But Austin doesn't have any of that sort of, it feels very liberal. It is, it is an unusual part of Texas. It is, it is actually quite liberal. Um, Everyone's got guns. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> of good. course. But that actually ironically makes them more polite. So you step out of the airport in Chicago, all you hear is people beeping their horns. Yeah. No one does that in Texas because they've got guns in their, in their glove box. Yeah. So, you know, they're all pretty polite, but um, it is it is very liberal. Um, and as a Kiwi, it, it, it's very easy to live there. And, and the Southern hospitality is a real thing. So you know, people open up their home to you. They're really friendly. Uh, we haven't had a issue with, with getting to know people and stuff which is great and you, you do find that in some places it's hard to break into those clips yeah which is important right because if you're going to move your family half around the world you've got to you've got to feel welcomed and, and the best part schools schools right uh, we were told that the public school system is better than the private one wow so and by more than one one group of people from some very well educated people as well so i thought that was quite right but texas schools in general are very good uh, but austin is, is just a great place not too far from the Uvalde, though, unfortunately. Yeah, no, we were there for that, man. I mean, yeah, it's a lot of problems America needs to, to fix yeah. uh, really, really quickly. So, product, you know, you are you do you see yourself as a as a as a product oriented company or sort of a solution for your customers? Um, for us, it's about a solution, but also making it as seamless as possible. So, there's there's two ways we look at it. One is for our commercial real estate and parking operators we want to ensure that they actually generate revenue from what we're doing. Otherwise, it'd be a one-stop, uh, a, a one and that's it, one and done. Um, they won't put any more infrastructure in. So if, in our business model, it doesn't take them long to get a station to break even. And then our argument is, because we keep, we've keep we got all the access to the data, we own all the hardware, we can then say to them, well, you now need more charges, because of our objective is to really accelerate the transition to electric transport. We've got to get more infrastructure on the ground. So we work really hard to make sure that the business model is, is operating for them so that they can get to profitability. Um, and then on the on the driver's side, because we've got that that piece as well, it's about is a and if you've been a driver, and I've, I've driven EV now for five years, and I at one point ran the EV program from already in 2009, which is way too early. But if you've been in that experience and look at it through the lens of not just the way you like to charge your car, but also thinking about your wife and, and your children and, and, and anybody who sort of gets out of a vehicle and is exposed to the external environment for any period of time, it's got to be really seamless, really fast and efficient. So I get out, I plug and I walk away. So we focus on, on that with that end of making it as simple as possible. So the software's a big part of that. And on the hardware side, because we're sort of seeing hardware being commoditized, as long as it fits a bunch of protocols that we need to operate to our software platform, we don't mind what it looks like. But we're all about um, scale and density. So one of the challenges that we see is that uh, a big player in the US uh, has 68,000 sockets across 17,000 locations. So they've got an average of four charging stations. Right. We don't think that that's a, that, that's a maintenance challenge. So we do a minimum of 50. So we'll dump 50 into a building. Uh, we're doing a building that has 150 charges in it. 
and only 650 spaces, um, again, scale and density, because that means that any driver that turns up can easily get a charge. They're not going to be queuing and waiting. If you do have anything that breaks, you haven't got a high proportion of your network out. So if you had four charges and two of them break, you have 50% failure rate. That's a photo on social media. Um, right. We focus on that ease for the driver and also uh, economics for the parking operator or commercial real estate. So if I play that back, there's a lot of thought that needs to go into your pitch to the customer that you've been thinking about the way you've described it around your customer's customer. Yep. yep. And, um, you know, you've been across software businesses, you know, a number in your career, as well as this new business, which is pretty much, you know, a hybrid. Yep. Um, we've got a lot of folks in our community who are just software. Yep. What do, you, what do you think the Venn diagram intersection is around building a business between a pure software play, like a software as a service, yeah. and a, a hybrid where you know, software is important, but uh, you've got other physical components as well? Yeah, I mean, we, we, obviously in the software world, we see a lot of, there's a lot of software that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah. So you've got to be very clear about who that end customer is and who's going to pay for it. So. On the other side, we take sales really seriously. So you know, some people think sales is a four-letter word. It is a prof it's a professional approach we take to sales and making sure that we're, we're generating revenue out of everything we're doing. So it's not just good enough to build something and think that people will come. You've got to think about, okay, well, how are you actually going to bring that revenue in? I mean, our strategy with what we deployed was relatively simple. If we had have gone out with that business model, and gone to VCs and bankers and said, hey guys, so we need some cash, we have a great idea. It's like, sure, we want all of your family, all of your children and your wife, mm. and you'll be left with 10%, and you should be grateful about mm. it. Instead, we went out and said, okay, this is our business model, let's sign some contracts, let's actually show that there's a business model people will pay for, and then that'll value up the business, and then we can, we can actually, A, not lose control, and B, um, generate value for everybody based on that massive addressable market, right? Because yeah. that's what you need as well. And, and you know. exactly. But if, you've, if your software is in any way, shape or form linked to some type of hardware, think about how that connection works and whether or not there's any control that you need to have in that space. I mean, with our, man, our hardware manufacturers, we actually work really closely with them. Um, there's also competitive attention, so you need to make sure that you know, there's, there's, uh, there's other players that are in the mix, so you're not just going to get that limited put you in the monopoly position but if there is hardware how does how do you manage that piece uh, if it's just software find the biggest market you can and just go at it really really hard uh, otherwise you end up with you know, 50 users don't be able to sell it that's good perspective and um that sort of leads me to my next question sorry folks i'm just um going through the initial questions which are all about um maybe being able to hear what we were saying uh, I think I've apologised enough for that now, but I, I can't apologise enough. Um, so thanks, Holly, for your question. Super exciting space. What are your priorities over the next 12 months? Uh, where are more charging spaces needed statewide? And who are you looking to hire? Oh, good. Someone, someone on the... Uh, and what skills do they need? I used to work for... Hope Cooper, and she <laughs> continually <laughs> sings your praises. I actually oh, know. Man. I've come across Holly before, <laughs> and Hope sings your praises too, Holly. Uh, in terms of us, we've so we've got to where we're at um, with mainly a small core group, and we manage external partners. Uh, so you know, we we did the numbers the other day, and there's something like 87 people working on what we're doing. 87, yeah, but we only have a core of that team, right? So in terms of where we're going with this next phase of funding, and at the moment, even though I'm over here, we're currently managing a raise that's going to be anywhere between 50 million and 300 million. Um, well, that's a range, 50 to 300 million. It's a range. And that comes back to, uh, if you are going to go into the States, and you know this better than anyone, there is a, as they say, it's return on bother. If you want to raise anything under 50 million in America, you will struggle. Mm. Um, in terms of where we're going with the team, so there's an entire, mostly a bunch of C-suite roles that we're going to roll in. So we're going to roll in a CTO um, that will sit across hardware, so we're going to put in the head of hardware. Um, we'll have some localised software people in the country, but the beauty of that with the guys in New Zealand is that we've got a, a long day development cycle. So yeah. if they work as a team, which we're very focused on, they can develop for 17, 18 hours a day, yeah. which is absolutely fantastic. So a couple of resources just to 
manage those the handoff and, and continue through those. But we'll, um, we're really committed to working with our partner over here. They're doing a fantastic job. Uh, so not a big team there. We'll, we'll just take maybe four or five software people out of, out of Texas. Um, sales support is important. Um, head of marketing, wish you got somebody lined up for that uh, out of New York, but um, some marketing resource. Man, it's a weird thing though, because demand is not really our issue at the moment. It's it's more supply. Right. So the way in which we've gone, the sales model that we've put in place has really resonated with um, with guys who have extensive networks, and so you know that pipe of three point three million, which they're telling me is going to be four within the next few months. It's just this huge amount of interest and demand in this space. So sales, we've, we'll put, we've got a couple of very senior people in there. Um, and then a lot of the heavy lifting, because we partnered with Joan Lang with Sale, so Joan Lang with Sale head our installation program. Right, that's smart. So they're the property people. Yep, uh, global property people. Mm. Um, and then they've got the national subcontractors up under them, so we don't have to manage you know, all of the complexities of that. Just because it's not one country, it's 50 states. Yeah. They all have their own electrical laws, so that's important. And then the big piece that I'm focused on at the moment, because as they say, see, see, I should be focused on three things, right? People, cult, uh, people culture, and um, finance. So a big piece for me, all the numbers, is um, is the cash raise. Because if we if we go to 120,000 charges, it needs roughly a billion dollars in capital. Mm. 500,000 is a chunk more. So... Um, our model, which actually the, the bankers love, they just need it. They want it to be a billion at this stage. Yeah, well, nearly. But yeah, um, a big part of our ongoing life will be raising, raising lots of cash. So. It's the real deal, mate. You're um, you're in a very different club to, to most of us founders, where we uh, where we spend a lot more time. Because how many? It's how many years since that crowdfund to today? Uh, it was done uh, early last year. Right. So yeah, we've been frugal. Um, we, our business model, again, it's, I was talking to a young guy in the States and he said, oh, you know, if you're just starting out, it's 20 years in the making and stuff, 30 years in the making. So, you know, I was in banking, so I understand what they're looking for. Mm. Um, we've got really good parking, commercial real estate networks, extensive networks, so that wasn't built in five minutes. Um, you know, we lined up all the pieces. But again, it was a thesis. And then you have to go in and say, okay, well, does this actually make sense? We've tweaked it quite a bit. We've stayed true to what the business is doing, but the way in which we do it has changed quite a bit. So, and a lot of that's driven by by the finance piece because we have to raise so much cash. But we're no different to everybody else who's sort of starting out. Where they say you've got two emotions you feel as an entrepreneur: euphoria and abject fear. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and that's just consistent, right? <laughs> well, I'm glad you raised that because I want to move into the personal side to whatever level you're comfortable. I mean. The first piece, really, personally, is just you know raising 1.3 on crowdfunding a year ago or thereabouts. Yep. Now you're sitting on top of a hundred to three hundred million dollar raise as an individual. You know, and is this your first CEO gig? Uh, yeah. So in, in, at this scale, so I run a little company back here in New Zealand uh, in terms of looking for stuff. But certainly, is that the one I bought that jacket off? Oh, no, that was this is some different. So okay. I cracked a couple of different links, but you know, I had this, a company focused on EV charging infrastructure. And right, solid back there. Oh region. yes, yes, yeah. But this is this is at a uh, it's a different league, right? So well, totally. And that's my question: is like, walk us through how you're thinking about keeping yourself. Uh, you know, like sitting in front of the sort of banking people, we must be sitting in for a hundred to three hundred million dollar raise. They're sitting there looking at you going, yeah. is this guy going to I do. be able to lead the company? And yeah. how do you think about that? And what are you planning to and have invested in yourself to? Yeah, look, uh, you know, it's like you never stop learning. So it's always, um, it's an ongoing process. And if you think that you're good enough, then you're usually wrong, right? So you, yeah. you, you've got to keep learning. Um, having good mentors uh, is really important. Um, not always following what they say uh, is, is good too. So you have your own thought process, but having people who have had experience who can give you good guidance and who actually care. Mm. So um, I think it was T. Burn Pickens said you should only take advice from people who are smart, don't have a um, don't have anything to gain by the advice and they love you. Mm. So you know if, if you find people who who share that sort of thing, uh, it's very hard, but you know that that sort of guidance. But they're right about um, you know, a lot of companies fail because of the CEO psychology. 
Mm. So I, I literally, to that point, was sitting in a meeting uh, as a little Kiwi on the 40th floor of JP Morgan, largest bank in the world, mm. who are fronting a funding piece for us, um, in front of a, of, a, of a fund that has 130 billion in assets, who one of their team had told me, we don't write equity checks under half a billion dollars. Literally, bang, just out of the well, you just say that's okay. We can <laughs> yeah. take it to half a billion. You're, just not, you're not allowed to have any emotion. <laughs> um, but yeah, and, and they are looking at you going, are you going to be able to handle this? So A, are you smart enough to do this? And B, do you have enough emotional intelligence to be able to manage your way mm. through it? Because if you don't, it's very easy to implode. And we've all seen public examples of that. So um, for me... You've got to have some balance, which becomes quite hard. I mean, yeah, it, it, in, in my case, uh, I've got a very supportive wife, so I'm pretty stoked with that. So, you know, you don't want to be t- fighting wars on two fronts, right? So you don't want to be coming home and having to battle anything. You've got to battle in the work environment. So having a good team and everybody's lined up, and, and that's you know, the biggest challenge with having someone who was back in New Zealand is that they were only hearing the good news. They've been seeing all right. the shitty stuff that you got to deal with. Mm. And when they're there with you, they get to see you come home defeated. Not, not defeated, but deflated, deflated after a yeah. tough day. Yeah. They can see the highs, they can see the lows, and then they get a better, a better appreciation. So that that was really important. Um, show no fear. So literally when they're talking about the scale of the numbers, and we, we're confident in our business model, so you have to go in there confident that you can do this. Show no fear. Because particularly, and, and you, you know this, Wall Street guys, they will rip your throat open mm. and watch you bleed out. Mm. So they're ruthless. Yeah, they're ruthless. And, and, and it's not because they do it for any, any sort of uh, negative things. It's just the way it's done. Mm. So you, you've got to, you've got to um, be confident about it, um, approach it. You know, we, we've been, what, what they've given us feedback about the way they like that we operate, we just operate like Kiwis. We're pretty transparent. Uh, we push back when we we see that it's not right. In terms of what we've done and the way we've approached it with the contracts and the valuation, and and we're just raising debt. So the 150, 150, 300 million, um, that's all debt. There's there's, there's no equity piece in there. Just leveraging it against the working capital and the products and stuff as they come through. And that takes a fair degree of confidence to go in there and do that as well. So we'd gone through... And I've got your address, right? Uh, they, yeah, know where you live. they know where I live. Yeah. But I would have done you know, 50 plus pitches, um, easy. And, and you get to a point where you just you're comfortable with material, you're confident, you ask real questions. There wouldn't be, there's very rarely a question I get now that I can't answer mm. because I've had to, but I like numbers. So that's a thing with me. So I understand all of my numbers, I understand how my business model works out, how it plays out, how we make money. You've got to understand all those pieces because if you don't, quite rightly, why would I give you money if I don't think you know what you're doing? Yeah. So, um, yeah, confidence and controlling your own psychology. And I, you know, regularly take breaks. Um, you know, we can have a bit of skiing and stuff like that, just a bit of blowout. Well, that's going to be my next question in terms of how you stay mentally and and physically well as and, and and all of that because it's a, it's a big grind, especially with the travel as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so literally, we were you know, we were all over the states. We've been all over the place, which literally. Um, but for me, you know, I, I have a regular exercise regime that I do. So early in the mornings, I do uh, I've done weights for this, so I do that. Uh, and then sport wise, I play tennis competitively, and that's always been something I love. Apart from the tennis record getting stolen when I live in the states, oh, that um, sucks. Yeah, that sucks. They stole my shoes too. I thought that was overconfident. And so yeah, I, I don't know whether I'd steal someone's shoes. I would steal tennis shoes. But, um, so yeah. Play a bit of sport, interact with people on a non sort of professional level. You end up talking about work invariably, but being able to do that. Um, it's also important that with the people that are with you on the journey that you can spend time with them outside of it as well. Yeah. I mean, we get a lot of stuff done just, you know, kicking around, having a bit of fun. Uh, sometimes it's hard to switch off, but yeah. But that, that balance is important as much as you can. Talk to me a bit, and folks, we're um we're we're, we're fifteen minutes to run, um, forty minutes out of which you actually were able to hear, and 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 the rest of it to try and subtitle or something in terms of because it was stunningly you know, it was, <laughs> that was great. Some secret to life questions there, but um, 
you know, Kiwis, you know, you mentioned it a few times and, and the positive side. Uh, and I'll be the first to put my hand up and say that I think we need to do a better job around us. You know, we tend to fluff around uh, in some of these meetings and some of the ways that we approach people. You know, you mentioned you went on one trip on the basis of hopefully, you know, subject to sickness or missing a bus or train or whatever for a 15 minute meeting. I mean, what do you think Kiwi found? What, what do you think of Kiwi founders that you've chatted with and you've maybe introduced to people? Um, uh, how, how well do you think they do in, in you know, shrinking down to those key things you mentioned? And, and what would your tips be for, you know, if, if the answer is, well, they could do better, what would your tips be for, for folks looking to get over there and do their first pitches? Oh, look, what I love about Kiwis is we've got some really bright people in this country who've got some fantastic ideas, mm. but they don't go big enough. And you've literally got to go, if you're going to do a market like America and you don't go large, you do go home. Yeah. So you, you've got to go, go large and back yourself to be able to do that. And I see a lot of really smart business people, uh, really smart people uh, with great ideas who are like engineers or technical people, and they don't surround themselves with people who know how to sell stuff, um, who can get out there and, and, and build up that distribution model of how to get your, your product or whatever it is in people's hands at scale because you know, sales is that duty word and it's it's not it's got to be a core part of, of what you do so everybody sells right everybody sells and we start doing it at a very young age my children always do it when they're in the supermarket trying to get lollies from so you know that that's super critical but you know i certainly see the the not wanting to scale is a, is a bit of self-doubt and, and not backing themselves. But I can tell you, if if you've come up with a good idea and people are buying it in this country, it'll fly off the shelves in, in bigger markets. It's so hard to, to uh, this, this is a very competitive market, a little bit cynical on the consumer side, very well-educated base, even though we kick ourselves and say we're not, it mm. is actually a well-educated um, population. Um, you know, if you can sell in this market and get any traction in America and those other markets, yeah, you're just away. So, but that's a big punt as well. I see a lot of people like, oh, I couldn't go over there and they pull these robots. Yeah, so we see so, a lot of that. Yeah, it's it's not it, it's not as hard as you would think. Uh, I would also, even though I sort of said I didn't get any money from the government, but I would look at um, NZT on those guys because they have some good programs. Yeah. They also have some networks that can help you with that piece. Uh, we just went and built our own, but um, and and again, agent stage, so you know, yeah, great years and all that sort of stuff. But there are some really good programs on that. One of the things I think is is a challenge that New Zealand doesn't do well, and we experienced this because we went into some global energy transition awards in, in Berlin, and we got to the top fifty in the world within a couple of hours. I had three cities reach out to me and say we like what you're doing would you like to come and live here yeah so you know from a oh so basically just poach you from new zealand yeah and, and you know the analogy i'd look at it is a bit like the all blacks poaching pacific island players right so they're going around guys are actually going looking and targeting yeah um they're doing that with business mm. and they're doing it and saying okay well if we have smart cities these are the types of technologies we need if this looks like it can do that Here's an incubator that you can come and stay in for free. So they would give us office space. They'd line you up with introductions to some of the big players. So Volvo, for example, was in there, those sort of guys. And then they'd go, right, let's see what happens here. And it, it wasn't high cost. Um, but that, for not only your domestic guys, but also seeding in some of those, those offshore things as well. Um, but, yeah, just get out, there, get out there and give it a go. What's the worst of it? Absolutely. Let's talk about that um, five-letter word that a lot of people think should be a four-letter word, sales. You know, if you had two minutes, which you do have, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a two-minute Nigel course on sales in terms of where to, where to go to get the best sort of upskill, you know, assuming I know very little or nothing about sales, who to listen to, core concepts. Yep. What, what, would, what would be your advice? Oh, look, um, 
uh, if you've got the time, you want to dig into it. Uh, IBM is actually uh, so that is a company is a company that you should have a look at because they do two things well. They build technology and they sell technology. Yeah. So you know, if anybody thinks that they're anything other than a big sales engine and a, and a tech side, and it's not true. They are very professional at sales. Um, but the the key to it in terms of getting your product out there is you obviously have to work out what your market is, but then you've got to give away value. So you've got to make sure that people are making money along that chain and there's an opportunity for them to make a lot of money. So, and don't be afraid of that. And it's a bit like, uh, you know, if you're spending a dollar and making a dollar fifty, just keep spending a dollar. Don't think you've got a marketing budget that you cap out and just keep spending a dollar. In our case, uh, we're, we're using a mix of direct and distribution, but we make sure we share value with anybody on the mm. distribution side. But find seasoned salespeople who, who are relevant in the market and speak the language of, of the consumers. Is relevance really down to the networks they have from previous gigs or what, what is it? Yeah, there's a bit of that. So, you know, we've pulled a couple of senior people out of, um, out of parking. So they have a massive network. Uh, commercial real estate, we're working with yeah. some guys that have commercial real estate networks. Yeah, so they sort of hunt in the same ecosystem. For... And they speak the language. Yeah. So don't go in and think as an engineer or somebody like that, you can sell to someone in real estate. If you've never been in real estate mm. or whatever that industry is, hire somebody who speaks that language. Um, the, the, the worst thing I see is, is somebody gets up with a deck that's been designed based on the way they think. Mm. And then they try and pitch it to somebody at the other side of the table that's just asleep in two minutes. So you've got to have those guys, guys and girls, that are not only heavily motivated, but also can sell to that. That, um, that industry or that vertical or whatever it is. Well, I think you talked about authenticity earlier on too in terms of, you know, you could get the research done, put the, power, the PowerPoint together and have it up there, but people would tell immediately that you really didn't have any depth to what you were presenting. Right? Oh, for sure. And, you know, if you can't, you've got to be able to sell it to the sales guys as well. Mm. So if you've got a dis- if you're identified salespeople or a distribution network and they don't get it, then you've got to fix that. Because they're the ones that are selling it. Yeah. But as soon as they do, like we've just seen the light bulb go on with the guys that we guys and girls we're dealing with, and they're like, "Oh, I can make a lot of money out of this." Mm. It's like, go forth. Um, so, being able to to not only sell to end customers but to whoever's going to be selling your product is critical. But don't be afraid to hire seasoned salespeople because it is a professional sport. And the good ones are really good at it. Mm. So um, yeah, yeah, they do. They treat it like a sport, don't they? Particularly in the US, it is, and it's a discipline. And they are literally go large. Yeah, folks, we're coming up to the last uh, seven minutes. Um, it's been uh, it's gone very quickly. <laughs> um, you're laughing about that mute thing. I feel so bad about that. Um, <laughs> Steve, g'day. Um, nice to see you online. Uh, Steve's question: There's a lot of battery research going on at the moment. Will you have hardware upgrades that will need to be done to keep up with the changing face of battery charge rates? That's a good question. Yeah, look, um, the, the biggest issue that's going to hit our market if we want to get specific about EV charging is the capacity, so market capacity. So, you know, I see new hardware solutions that come out every day, like megawatt chargers, you can charge a battery in five minutes. You still have to feed it with a whole lot of electrons. So and that's got to come from somewhere. So you've got to balance where we're seeing these battery moves with A, can they do it at scale? So if you've been following Tesla and Panasonic and all those guys, it's taken them a long time to get there and they're not even there in terms of mm. some of the mass scale challenges um, that they're all going to have to face, you know, GMs and Ford and all those sort of guys. So I see a lot of stuff around new battery chemistries and things like that, but they're still going to overcome the scale problem. But our, our, where I see the biggest challenge is not the EV charging hardware today. I mean, the, we've, we're thinking about, okay, so what's going to happen to the vehicles in the future? So we've already got to be looking and we ha- are having active conversations about inductive charging. Yeah. Because um, yeah. essentially what's happened to the phone, right? You do wireless. Yeah. yeah. But you, if you look at the way the car's going to evolve, because it's not about the charger evolving, it's about the vehicle. Mm. So the the way I'm, the most efficient way to transfer electrons at the moment is a piece of copper. Mm. So there's going to be physical connections for some time. 
Um, and then there's going to be autonomous vehicles that someone physically plugs in, and then there'll be autonomous vehicles that are charged wirelessly. And the reason why I think that's the case, although I did sit next to somebody on the plane who thinks they may have cracked this, <laughs> is um, as you do, as you do, is uh, inductive charging still has inherent losses. So you, you only got to look at an inductive hob versus a yeah. traditional hob, and there are some losses. And as the world goes through this trans, this multi-trillion transition from the fossil fuel economy to the electron economy, losses are material. So the first phase of that is going to be plug this thing in physically. And then as all of that infrastructure gets upgraded, then you can shift to something cool like conductive. But from our perspective, we don't actually care. So because we own the contract to all the spaces and because we say to them, we take the technology risk. If a new charger comes out, then that's what we'll roll out. In fact, it's actually what we're doing. So we are literally in Florida going to be deploying the largest um, EV charging network that's ISO 15118 capable. So that means that it can communicate with the car in a different way and is actually bi-directional capable. So it, hasn't been wired, it won't be wired to do that straight away, but it could do that in the future so we can pull energy from the cars at scale. So there's a technical version of diversity and inclusion. It is. It is. Yeah. So yeah, look, yes, I think the hardware will change and evolve um, as it has, um, but we'll evolve with it, and you and you have to. Very cool, mate. It's been um, it's been great chatting, uh, folks. If you've got any last questions, we've got four minutes to run. Um, what are your next challenges, and and you know what, what what's keeping you up at night? Although you know you're staying balanced and taking good breaks and so forth with the family, which is great to hear, but. You know, you're building a big business. What's uh, what's up next in terms of, uh, geez, I haven't quite figured out how to do that bit yet. Oh, look, our biggest challenge is to do the 120,000 charges we need a billion dollars. So we're very focused on the cap raise and how that works. So we've got to balance not only capital raising, but making sure that we retain control. Right. Uh, so it's a long journey for you in terms of capital planning, isn't it? It's a long journey and a big piece piece of it because we are an as a service model, hardware and software included, is you need a chunk of change. Now, the beauty of the way in which we've constructed it is it actually appeals to the debt side of the, of the, yep. the market, but at scale. I mean, I, I'd heard of vaguely the return on bother statement, but it's a real thing. In the so it's the right? beginning of a Catherine Tate sketch, I think. You know. <laughs> is it? Oh, I don't am, look at am that. I bothered? Yeah. yeah. Like, return on bother. Oh, I, is, love yeah. I love yeah. it. Return yeah. on bother. And you, they literally, that rolls off their tongue. So yeah. if you know, these big infrastructure firms, and we're talking you know, KKR, BlackRock, Macquarie, uh, GIP, all those big companies are like, I like what you're doing, but you know, I've got a billion dollars. I've got $6 billion I have to deploy. I can't deploy it in five million dollar lots it's just too hard yeah too long yeah so we, we've never been kicked out of a meeting so everybody goes oh, literally the finance guys start like this and go i've heard lots of these pitches around electric vehicle charges yeah, yeah and then they go like this and then they lean in and then they're getting okay those. now i get it yeah so the big ones in particular are all saying come back come back but the, 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 when you're big but that's probably that's the the big things for me in terms of keeping me awake is the finance piece, making sure that we create, build that, that culture that keeps people engaged and excited. Um, we have, uh, like a lot of companies, we have a no our assholes principle, so we've all worked in those environments. Yeah. So you know, making sure, and then the, the big piece about that culture, obviously, if you're bringing in these people is, and good people is, how do we keep the team balanced and how do we um, make sure we're getting the best and the brightest? So. Yeah, those are the, the big things that I worry about. As long as we get people in, we've given them the right objectives, the right degree of ownership, then that them doing their vertical and looking after their teams should be easy, easier from my perspective. Um, but making sure that we are, I, I'm personally involved in this hiring, the hiring process because it's just critical. You don't want to get that wrong. Um, the cultural stuff is really important. And we, you know, it's, it's interesting, the Americans are making us, not that we didn't want to do it, but they are passionate about us having a Kiwi core to our culture, which I was, I was quite surprised by. Yeah. So every American we talk to is like, oh, New Zealand's on the bucket list, I want to go. Yeah. You tell them it's 15 hours, they'll rethink that one. Yeah. But, you know, that cultural piece is, is also super critical. Um, yeah. 
so those are the ones that they want. Yeah, that's good to hear. And um, I think that has changed quite a bit, um, certainly from my experience in Silicon Valley, because it used to be a nice place to visit. They had no desire to actually do any business there or keep any of the kind of business culture or culture. And so that's very cool. But I'm going to do some housekeeping. And then uh, the last word is over to you. And, uh, and the question that you can prepare for is just, you know, um, 30 seconds left on the clock. You've got one piece of advice that generically is going out to founders at all different stages in all different sorts of business. What will it be? Um, while Nigel's com sort of contemplating on that, um, thanks everyone for watching. Apologies about the, the kickoff. Never happened before that it's been on mute, but there you go. You learn something every day. Thanks to our sponsors. So it's really the only reason Territory 3 can do what it does. New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, Amazon Web Services, K1W1, Avenda Management and Jasmine Holdings. Thank you. Uh, thanks most importantly to you for watching. I uh, really appreciate it. For anybody that you think uh, has missed today that um, gets some benefit out of hearing about Nigel's journey, um, just go to territory3.community forward slash academy and this will be uh, live on that site in about one hour's time. Nigel Broomhall, thank you so much. Invisible Urban. Um, what's this last enduring piece of, of perspective and advice to founders? <laughs> I, I will go with the old African proverb, which oh. is um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with people. Um, you know, we use that um, tangata um, Maori proverb in a lot of our presentations and talk about the people, the people, the people. So that 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 piece is is super critical in terms of how you're going to do this. So find some a group of people, a co-founder, whoever it is that you uh, that's complementary but not the same that you can um, spend time with uh, and enjoy time with that pushes you. Um, that you, there's a, it can make you feel uncomfortable, but you can't do this journey by yourself. You have to do it with others um, so, and, and gather others on that journey as well. Otherwise, you, you won't go far. So uh, you, know, you go to very dark places, as you know, in, the, in this stuff. Um, and you can go in a lot of self-doubt, but if you've always got people around, you can bounce off. So find a good co-founder or co-founders and, and do it as a team. Fantastic, mate. Can you say that phrase again? Because I'm just um, I'm still contemplating it. So it's... If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. Very cool. Yeah. Nigel Broomhall, kudos on your progress because it's stellar <laughs> and, and having the balls to, to go offshore as fast and as far as you did. And um, thanks for watching, everybody. Catch you next time. Cheers. Cheers.